Well, good morning again, everyone. Oh, that was bad. There was nothing. There was nothing that time. Silence. Good morning again. Thank you. I just need that little bit of validation, you know, just that you're hearing me, you're listening, you know. Thank you. Awesome. Sounds great. All right. If you could open up your Bibles that you have with you to Ephesians chapter 4. If you do not have a Bible with you, there should be a brown hardcover in a seat in front of you. And if you have one of those brown hardcover ones, it's page 1175. Look that up for you so that you didn't have to try and find it yourself. Okay. So we'll be covering verses 17 through 24 in chapter 4 of Ephesians. So I just want to start us with this thought. Every single day, we are bombarded with advertisements and commercials telling us how this particular product will come in and make us new, will give us a new life, will make everything better for us. And marketers understand this really well. They know how to touch at the human emotion to get them to sense that need from whatever they're trying to sell. And that creates great profit for them. They get all kinds of people to buy stuff that, we, that they really don't need, but they really more like want. So they, you, you might have this situation where they'll say, a new TV will heighten your movie watching or TV watching experience. It'll be like nothing you've ever experienced before. A new makeup product will make you look younger and more beautiful than ever before. A new car will bring happiness and, and four-wheel drive to your life that you've never had. Or even in TV and movies in particular with the youth culture, teenage culture, you'll hear something along these lines that if you are not in a relationship, then there's something wrong with you. That you need a romantic relationship in order to be fixed. And we are really sensitive to this at this time of year, but we know, we know that this excitement from the new thing will eventually wear off. That's what these things do. So we're going to have to look for something else in order to create that same feeling of newness and happiness. And all that really does is it's just going to make us increasingly unhappy and then just tear away at our wallets and our bank accounts because we can't afford to keep up with all that. And because we're in this new year and we're coming up with New Year's resolutions, We're going to be especially sensitive to these kinds of things. We're going to be more, I guess, more vulnerable because we're looking at all these different things that we might want to change about ourselves. But what if I told you that what you are looking for, that the realities of a new life are already in front of you in the person and the work of what Jesus Christ has done. And that maybe the problem we're having is that we're seeking from possessions and relationships with Jesus is already offering us through knowing him. So we're going to take a look at our Bibles this morning. If you would please stand, I'm going to read for us the passage we're going to go through today. And we're going to stand in in honor of God's word. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to, every pra- to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word that speaks to us, that you gave to us. God, that opens up our hearts and exposes us for what we are. But God, we thank you also for your incredible love. Your incredible love that that gives us a new life, that gives us hope, that gives us peace. And so God, we thank you for this morning that we could be together and to worship you. And we pray that your name, amen. Man, maybe seated. So before I dive in and dig into this passage and explain it a little bit, I want to give some history into this letter that we find this passage in. The letter is called Ephesians, and it was written by the Apostle Paul to a group of people living in the city of 
Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is located in Asia Minor. And within Ephesus, you had this massive temple. I have a picture up there. This temple devoted to the Greek goddess Artemis, who was over the hunt and over fertility. It was this massive thing. And this is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was four times larger than the Parthenon in Athens. So this is a massive structure. And all kinds of pretty awful things would happen at this temple in order to appease Artemis. You'd have things like prostitution going on. You'd have some obscene forms of dancing. I'm keeping it very general, not getting into detail. You would have animal sacrifices and you would also have clothing sacrifices. And what this was is, like I said, it was, it was appeasing this Greek goddess. And people would be doing these things in order to get what they wanted to, you know, for Artemis to bless their hunt and to bless their fertility so that they could have children. And so Paul, we look, and we, if we know from the book of Acts, which is earlier in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, we see the story of how Paul came to the city of Ephesus and he was teaching them something completely different than what the temple of Artemis was teaching them. He was teaching them that, no, there is a God out there who loves you and you don't have to appease him through religious rituals. But what you do is you give your life to him because he gave your li his life for you. That he loved you and gave himself up for you. And this is totally contrary and would actually come against not just some cultural views, but also some economical views. Because as well, like I said, they, they sacrificed clothing. And so there were businesses that were making really expensive clothes so that people could buy them and then give them to Artemis. So people made huge profits off of this temple. And so Paul comes in and he starts to give this message. He starts to tell them about Jesus Christ who loves them and gave himself up for them. And the Ephesians start a riot. They get angry and they basically kick him out. And they're even yelling, great is Artemis. Great is Artemis. And they're kicking him out. And so the cultural pull would have been really hard even for the Ephesian Christians knowing that some of their livelihoods were going to be wrapped up in what happened at the temple and that in some ways, you know, their culture was so, they, this is what they grew up in. This is what they knew. And so there would be a really large temptation to go back to it. And so this is where we find what we're talking about here. Look at what Paul says, verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer, no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. When Paul says no longer walk, that's a concept that's used a lot in the Bible to talk about the way that your life is lived, the way that you make your decisions, the way your character, the way that you interact with people, and how you live. And Paul is saying you are no longer to walk, to live the same way as the Gentiles do and look, it's in the futility of their minds. What he's saying is that the way that they're living is, is pointless. It's without meaning. There's no, there's no general reason for them to be living in this way. And he says they are darkened in their understanding. So they were blinded. They couldn't see. Alienated from the life of God. So separated from God because of the ignorance that is in them. They're, they're, they were ignorant and and their hearts were hard, is what he says. Their hearts were hard. And he says they became, they have become callous. And what he's talking about, Paul is really pushing this point home. He's really saying it almost in the same way over and over again. That the word of God, that the, the, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ coming and dying for us cannot, was not penetrating, was not coming into their hearts. And it's kind of like this concept. I dated a girl in college who liked to use her dad, an example of her dad, as how to, you know, that you need to show her respect because he was quite the manly man. Now, he was a large man, and I met him one time, and he had these hands that if you shook his hand, I mean, they just completely sucked your hand into it. And 
I mean, I'm a tall guy, but I have small hands for a tall guy. And, but I mean, I was, my hand was gone. It just disappeared into his hand. But he also worked with his hands. So his hands were incredibly calloused and thick. And so this girl told me this story about her dad. They were camping one time and a bee landed on his hand and he watched and the bee started to try and sting his hand, but his hand was so calloused that the sting couldn't penetrate the skin. And so he just chuckled <laughs> and crushed it and then threw it off to the side. It's kind of this similar concept that the heart, their hearts are, were so callous that they were, that they, that God's word couldn't penetrate, couldn't come in to their hearts. And it's because it says, it's because they've given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to, pra to practice every kind of impurity. And this is a thing that, that Paul is really trying to make sure that we understand that our lives must not look exactly like the world around us. We are supposed, as Christians, we are supposed to be different. I think there's this really huge temptation as Christians that we genuinely want people to come to know Jesus so badly that we'll try and meet them where they're at too far that we will then compromise. And then we won't look like Christ anymore. We'll look like the rest of the world. And this is what Paul's warning against. And I'm telling you, if anyone ever came to me and said to me, you know, Chris, you and I are basically the same person. You know, I can't tell the difference between you and me, whether you have, you know, something special in your life. You know, the only difference between you and me is I get to sleep in on Sundays. That would break my heart. That would be hurtful because, and not like hurtful in the way where I'm upset at them, but just realizing, wow, I have not done this right. I've messed this up. I'm not supposed to look like the rest of the world. The testimony of scripture actually, of the Bible actually says that, you know, we're supposed to look different in that if anything gets in the way of us having a closer relationship with Jesus, that we're supposed to get rid of it. Hebrews says that if there's anything that hinders us, we need to cast it aside. Jesus even says if anything causes you to stumble, or more, he gives a very graphic picture, if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. He's not literally saying that because every single one of us would be walking around blind, if that's what he really meant, okay? But, that, but he's talking about if there's anything in your life that's causing you to be distracted or to sin because you're you know, because you're going more towards, or, towards those things, that we're supposed to cast those aside. So we have to ask ourselves this question, why is it that we go after those things? And I think oftentimes we go after those things because we find them more valuable. A common vice that has been in my life has been something along the lines of sports. Okay, I love sports. And God over the last three years has been saying, that seems to be more important to you because I would react very, very poorly when my team lost. So when my team lost dramatically and horribly yesterday, <laughs> God and I had a little conversation that he reminded me, hey, it's just a game. <laughs> this happens. You have something that's incredibly more valuable and so we need to be casting things off. We need to be changing the way that we think about things. And so we have to ask ourselves, is God worth it enough to get rid of anything that hinders us from following him? Because if we're honest, we, if we know who God is, we know that he really is worth it. He is incredibly worth it because of who he is. And so Paul continues this and he says, but... That is not the way you learned Christ. So he's saying all that stuff about the Gentiles, that, you know, people who are outside the church, this is not, that's not how you learn Christ. You learned, assuming that you have heard about him, is what he's saying, and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So he's saying to take your old life, so this life that you used to live in, this life that used to uh, identify you, that used to live, that that is cast out. 
That you are to cast that away, to get rid of it. He says it's, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Here's where it gets down to the nitty gritty. Because Paul is saying, look, the problem isn't with what you're doing on the outside. The problem is with something on the inside. Every single one of us, when we're born, we are born into what we call the sin nature. That means we have a net natural tendency to go towards sin and to go to, you know, against the things of God. It's just what is built into us. And so we have these desires that are in our hearts that are not from God, that are not what he desires for us. We're all born with it. And here's a, here's a test of how you can know this. I'm sure every single one of us at some point in our lives, even if it's in the last week or the last hour, have had a thought pop, in, pop up in our minds and we think, where did that come from? That is horrible. I don't want to think about that. And if, any, and if somehow, by some miracle, horrible miracle, it, that thought got projected on the screen, you would know that everyone around you would think you were a, an awful person. We all have, like, let me tell you, we all have those thoughts, every single one of us. But that's because that's part of the sin nature. That's what has happened to us. But here's where the good news comes in. Paul says to put off the old self that is like the world and put on the new life that is like, that is made like Christ. So he starts, verse 23, he says to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. What God wants to do is to come into your life and change the way that you think and change your heart. Redeem it like we just sang. Redeem it for his glory and for his purposes to make you new. The beautiful thing is that God didn't just leave you to figure this out by yourself. God actually made a way for this to happen. But when you're a follower of Christ, there needs to be this noticeable difference. If we look exactly like the rest of the world, how can we compel anyone to become a Christian? I don't think that we really can. I think the problem is, is and I know this is a problem for myself, is oftentimes I just want them to like me. Just want those people to think I'm a nice person, that, I'm, that I love them, I like them. But here's the problem. Look at, we're going to look at a verse, 1 Peter 4, 4 through 5. We have that up there for us. Damon, yeah, you're perfect. Thank you, sir. With respect to this, Peter's kind of talking about the same thing, about a, a new life, a different life. They are surprised when you not join in with them in the same flood of debauchery. So that's just the life of pursuing anything and everything you know, that could be described in the temple of Artemis. And they malign you. And so they're going to look at you and they're going to say, if you're living this life that's the new life and staying, you know, casting out your old life, they're going to be, they're going to malign you. They're going to hate you. They're going to make fun of you. That's the point. Like, and Jesus even said it himself. You will be hated because of me. Jesus warned them of that. Because what the gospel is about who Jesus Christ is and what he did goes totally contrary to what the rest of the world thinks and says. And yes, we do need to you know, have a good, you know, reputation with people who are not in the church. That's supposed to happen as well. But we are also, in some ways, we are, in many ways, we are supposed to look totally different. But this is something that we have to understand, and it's a beautiful thing, this new life. Look at what he says, to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So this new self is created after the likeness of God. We were created, if you look in Genesis 1, we were created in the image of God, which is the word image is like this reflection, this likeness. We were made to look and act like God. But what happened when sin entered the picture is that we lo we've gotten that distorted. And so now it needs to be redeemed. It needs to be remade. But here's the amazing thing about this concept, about this story, is that God didn't leave us there. God didn't look down on us and say, oh boy, those poor sinners, those poor messed up people, I hope they figure it out. Good luck with that. No, 
What God did is he came down in the form of Jesus Christ in human flesh. He lived that perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins in our place that we deserved. And not only that, not only that, he rose from the dead, which is God saying, I am offering a new life, a whole new, brand new life for you to have. And not just that, that God, that Jesus also, after he rose from the dead, he then ascended into heaven. And when he ascended into heaven, that allowed for the Holy Spirit to come down. The other part of God, the Holy Spirit came down and that he now dwells, dwells within every single one of us. And the job of the Holy Spirit is to make us more like Jesus in the new life. The Holy Spirit is to come and to make us new, to renew our hearts, redeem our hearts, to take that sin nature and to redeem it. And this is the beauty of it. God didn't just leave us there to figure it out. And so God has made this way. God has made it happen. And the cross itself, looking at it, knowing it, it rats every single one of us out that we need a savior because every single one of us have sinned. Every single one of us. None of us are without it. But this is the, the beautiful thing about it is with the Holy Spirit coming into our lives is that God is promising he's going to enable you to make you more like Jesus. This is what the Holy Spirit's job is to do. So we're going to look at a verse from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 where he says, Now may the God of peace himself, this is Paul talking again, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. So when he says the God of peace will sanctify you completely, to be sanctified means to be set apart from the rest of the world. So this whole casting out the new life and putting on, or the old life and putting on the new life, that, that, that's what we call being sanctified. And then we have this concept, and it's my favorite Christian buzzword at the moment, called sanctification. And what sanctification means is that God, through the process of your life, is going to use circumstances and events in order to make you more like him, in order to continue the work of making you more like Jesus. And the incredible thing is, look at that, the end of this verse in 1 Thessalonians. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. And that God is faithful to make you more like Christ. That the, that's your life, that God wants to use anything and everything to make you more like Christ. That God is going to do it. And that this is his promise. Another one of my favorite verses in the Bible is from Philippians 1 chapter 6 where he says, I am confident of this very thing that he, being God, who began a began this work in you, will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. That someday, that God throughout our life is going to bring this to completion. He's going to keep working. He's not going to give up on you. He's relentless. He is absolutely relentless that he wants to make you more like Jesus. And it's out of his incredible love. It's not out of this angry God thing where he's mad at you because you're such a screw up. Okay? That's all of us. Let's be honest. Okay? And but he's saying, no, I love you enough that I've paved a way so that I can do this work in you. I want to do this. So I want to close with this imagery. If you know anything about silversmithing, and when a silversmith gets a sample of silver, he never finds it in the ground pure and exactly like he wants it. He has to dig it out of the ground and he has to take it and put it under intense pressure and heat and let it sit there within that heat. And eventually what's called dross, so the extra stuff, the stuff that he, the silversmith doesn't want because he's trying to get a pure sample of silver, eventually that stuff starts to burn off and disappear. And what ends up happening 
is as that continues to burn and burn and get hot, all that dross burns away. And so then how does the silversmith know when he is done? When he can look down into the silver and see his own reflection. And that this is what God desires to do in us. To put in our lives, to put us through, you know, to allow these hard things to happen in our life. But he's allowing this intense heat and pressure because he wants to make us more like him. It's a gracious, loving thing that he's doing because he's trying to change us. And I don't know about you, but many times I want to be changed. There are many things about my life that I look at myself and go, God, just change that. I don't like that about myself. And so I want to take a moment just to get real. When, when we talk with the students, when I'm teaching them at youth group or Sunday morning, I try and take a moment to get real, to just say, here's where this has been real in my life. This is where I've learned it personally. For most of my 20s, I struggled with depression. So far that I had to be on antidepressants. Um, it wasn't that heavy of a dosage. I was never um, so depressed that I was suicidal. It was more like a depressed, like, why even try anything? So my job performance where I was working was suffering because I just, was, it just didn't seem like it was, there was a point. But over the years, what God was revealing to me and telling me through what the Bible has to say was saying, look, I was allowing this really difficult time in your life because I was trying to reveal something to you that was not about who I am. I was trying to reveal to you that your life was really about yourself and what you were upset about was that your life, the way that you wanted it to go, wasn't going the way it was, you wanted it to go. That you need, that God was saying, you need to trust in what I have in store for you, who I am, and make sure that I am getting the glory and that it's not about you. And that took a long time. And eventually, I'll, by the grace of God, it broke. I haven't struggled with depression for a couple years now because I believe God redeemed and made me new and renewed my mind. It is a work that God did, not something that I did. And this is the kind of work that God wants to do in your life. He wants to come in and renew things for you. And if you're a person in here that's never given your life to Jesus, this is the incredible offer he's giving. He's giving this offer to forgive you of your sins because he died on the cross in your place. He's offering you a new life by, because he raised from the dead. And he is also offering you himself, his Holy Spirit, to live in you and to change you through what he did by ascending into heaven. This is the offer. And so if this, you know, if you are, if you're sensing this, this is something you want to do, don't leave here today without saying something that you want to give your life to Jesus. But if you are a person that's been in church for a long time and this is something that's regular, find those areas in your life where you need to say, okay, God, this is where we need to do a little bit of work. This is where we need to allow for the heat and the pressure to come in to change me. And so all of this, this isn't simply a matter of behaving rightly and making the right kind of choices. This isn't about really looking good before everybody. What this is about is about allowing Jesus' life to become your life and to be completely changed by him. We're not to look like the rest of the world, but we are to look like Jesus. And in any way that we are looking like the world, we need to just come before him and say, God, I confess it. I'm, I'm sorry. I need your forgiveness. And so, and the Bible says that he is just and faithful to forgive us when we confess our sins. But he is also gracious to transform us. Let's take a moment to pray. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word that can come and speak to us and tell us where we need to change, but God, that you are so gracious and loving that you didn't leave us to stay there, that you have given us an, an 
and paved a way for us to know you. And not just know you, but for you to change us and so that we can become like you. And so, God, we thank you for this morning, this beautiful snowy morning. God, we just pray that this would be all for your glory and all for you. And we pray this in your name. Amen. I invite you to pull out your communication cards once again. Uh, we have some next steps on there. Now, look at the first, the first next step is to identify three to five areas in your life that are part of your old life that you're still holding on to and not the new life in Jesus. So pray for God to help you cast those aside. And then as well, make a list of all the ways that God has changed you. So you can take a moment and, and see how God has been faithful and how he has changed you and made you new. And then take the challenge to do lesson one in the Real Thing Journal. Right over here, you can't see it. Right here in the new journal. Uh, pick one of these up if you haven't already for next week and do the journal. Uh, and then if you've committed your life to Christ for the first time today, please indicate that for us um, as the offering comes by. So we're going to pray to receive our offering at this time. God, thank you for this morning and we thank you for the money that you have given us. It is a blessing, God, that we live in the country that we live in, God, that has unprecedented wealth. And so, God, we don't want to give out of an obligation because we're supposed to, but God, because we are joyfully responding back to you because of who you are and what you have done. And that we are giving this money back to you for your kingdom and for your glory. So God, we thank you for this morning that we could be together to worship. And God, we just give this offering to you. Praise your name. Amen. We fall down, we lay our crown at the feet of Jesus.